Thank you very much, and I'm uh, very thankful that you are joining us today, and especially uh, thank you goes to CASBO for partnering with us to provide this very important webinar. We at Keenan are very thankful to have Dr. Scott Poland speaking this morning on this topic. Now, Dr. Poland, who is, is the co-director of the Suicide and Violence Prevention Office at NOVA Southeastern University in Florida. Dr. Poland's been a responder to 13 different school shootings, including two of them in California. He is very dedicated to prevention and identifying the lessons that have been learned from these school shootings. Dr. Poland has also presented well over a 1,000 workshops in every state and numerous foreign countries. He has also served on the President's Roundtable for Youth Violence and has testified before Congress regarding the safety of our children. Dr. Poland, you may recognize the name, is also the author of many of our Keenan Safe Schools and Keenan Safe Colleges courses that deal with suicide prevention. It's with great pleasure that I go ahead and turn this on over to Dr. Scott Poland. Thank you very much, Kathy. Indeed, it's my pleasure to have a chance to talk today, and I hope to say some things meaningful and helpful to every single one of you. I know you're all very concerned about school safety and how can we prevent further acts of violence in American schools, and especially this week, as sadly there was a school shooting in Sparks, Nevada. And I don't have a lot of first-hand information about that, and, it, and sometimes it takes weeks, months, even years before we get a better understanding of what has happened. But I want to make just a couple of comments. I would encourage to see that the police department are at least thinking about charging the parents of the student gunman for failing to safeguard their gun from their child. I do know that rarely, if ever, uh, have those charges ever been filed, and I personally believe that we do need to hold adults accountable. They are the ones that purchase guns, and with that comes responsibility. I was also a little dismayed to see that school would be closed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in Sparks, Nevada. I actually wrote an article about why it is important to reopen school as quickly as possible because I argue that schools are the places where most young people get the attention and the help that they need. And I can understand closing a school for a day or two days because you need to help the faculty first, but I'm sorry that students aren't going to be back at school sooner because I believe most young people have parents who are both working, and when school is closed, they're largely left to their own devices. But I'd like to begin today with a cover story of some time ago that definitely got my attention, and it was the USA Today headline after a shooting in Ohio. And it talks about the number that were injured, but then it basically talks about and identified this school shooter as just an average kid. And, you know, one of the things I hope I'll get across today is school shooters are really not just average students. There is something about their demeanor, behavior. There are a number of factors that should come to our attention and help us understand the need for increased mental health services. And I'm always saddened when our media seems to glorify and dramatize the perpetrator of the school shooting. I really don't think she should be on the cover of national magazines. And I'll be using some names today, but purely for the purpose of us all learning more about school shootings and hopefully preventing the next one. And as we move on, I want to talk about a really very important book that came out a couple of years ago. A well-known psychologist by the name of Peter Langman wrote a book, Why Kids Kill. And in that book, he um, really reviewed 10 different school shootings. And most importantly, nine of those school shootings were committed by middle school or high school perpetrators. And he basically said these acts are based understood as a rampage. <clears throat> he also talked about 
there being three types of school shooters. And what I'm about to do is really highlight three different places where I was a national responder, and those shooters are believed to be examples of the types that Langman wrote about. And the first two types that we're going to be looking at are the psychopath, or what we often refer to as a sociopath, somebody who is very narcissistic. They view themselves as godlike, as superior to the rest of mankind. They typically lack any kind of empathy, and they are essentially antisocial and sometimes sadistic, where a psychotic type is someone who really does not have good contact with reality. They may be hearing or seeing things that are just simply not there, and they are experiencing delusions. So let's look first at one of the Columbine perpetrators, and that would be Eric Harris. And Eric Harris today, we know a great deal about he and his co-perpetrator, Dylan Klebold. Um, and basically, some people have commented, these two shooters left more behind to explain themselves than like any murderers in our history. And of course, it did take a long time for the various reports, the basement tapes, lots of interviews, and lots of things to be released. But since it's been so many years now, there is a great deal of information. And I'd actually prefer not to read every word of Eric's rants to you, but I think as you look at it, you immediately see that basically extremely angry, viewing himself as very superior to others and really not caring whether he lives or dies and really wanting to hurt as many people as possible. And I know when I went there that basically the police were talking about perhaps best to view Columbine as a failed bombing because they estimate that had those bombs that they planted in the school had gone off when the most students were in the cafeteria at any time of the day, perhaps as many as 300 or more people could have actually been killed. So there are a couple of other comments about really the grandiose, dramatic statement that Eric Harris wanted to make to the world, that it would be bigger than all these things that you see on the screen all rolled up together really trying to make quite a statement and start a revolution with really their goal of living in infamy. And sadly, I believe that they have accomplished their goal in that most young people today, even though it's been 14 years, they would know a lot about Eric and Dylan. A couple more of his comments about if it moves, kill it. If it doesn't, burn it. Kill them all. Kill mankind. So a great deal of anger, a great deal of rage, superiority, lack of a conscience. And we know a lot of things about Eric today based on all the writings that uh, some of you may not remember that he was actually in a juvenile diversion program. So was Dylan after breaking into a van. They were actually let out of that program early because of their excellent behavior. And Eric in particular knew how to say just what it was that adults wanted to hear. And there were many warning signs in projects and things at school. I mean, I believe strongly that if a kid in a psychology classroom is talking aloud to everyone about their recurrent dreams about blowing up the school and shooting people, that is a very clear warning sign. Or when they turn in projects where they have written about being contract killers for hire and have actually filmed themselves simulating carrying out hits in the school and also have turned in uh, films that showed them in the woods with real guns blowing things away. I mean, these are pretty clear and obvious statements that more needs to be done in terms of dramatic intervention, mental health, engaging parent cooperation and community resources. 
Well, the next one I would like to look at, um, I also went to Heath High School in Paducah, which is a long time ago, but that young man opened fire on the prayer group. He killed three. By the way, it's interesting that the three girls he killed, Casey, Jessica, and Nicole, their parents formed a foundation and actually sued the maker of the point-and-shoot video game Doom and sued the maker of a motion picture that graphically depicted a school shooting. Neither one of those lawsuits were successful, but personally, I am very glad that they raised those questions. Well, Michael Carneal, who was a ninth grader at the school at the time, is believed to be an example of a psychotic school shooter. Michael basically was hearing and seeing things and tasting things that weren't there. He slept with a knife um, in his bed, believing there were monsters in the basement that might come out and try to kill him in the night. He taped up all the vents in his room so evil spirits couldn't get in. And he's doing a long sentence in the state penitentiary in Kentucky. But he has tried for a new trial, basically saying that he was mentally ill. And it's also very interesting to know that he talked for over a year about shooting up the school. He actually showed students a gun prior to the shooting, and he warned some students just the day before, don't be at the prayer group tomorrow. And we'll talk in a moment about, unfortunately, there's quite a pattern with somebody always knows about threats of violence. And it's just vitally important that students know to come forward. Now, I want to insert one thing here to make some key points. And a couple of years ago, I responded to a tragic school shooting in a suburb of Rio de Janeiro. And that school shooter also is believed to be an example of someone who was psychotic. But I met a remarkable principal there. His name was Luis. And Luis and I could only communicate through an interpreter. But I think it's important that I just take a moment and tell you why I was so impressed with Luis. He said things like, we're going to reopen the school as quickly as possible as soon as we get our staff members assisted with their own personal needs. We know the school is the place where kids do get the most help. We are not going to turn away any sources of assistance. We are not going to glamorize and dramatize the perpetrator. Every chance I get, I'm going to be talking about the victims and the survivors and how we all help them move forward. We know the shooting occurred in May and we only have a couple weeks of school left and we're gonna be making plans to help our uh, affected students, teachers, and families over the summer vacation as well. And there's going to be three shifts of psychologists at our school every day for the foreseeable future, a morning and an afternoon and an evening shift so that families can come get help in the evening. And then he said, and we'll be using mapping to try to figure out who among our students and staff are going to be the most affected. And then he basically talked about something I know all about, which is circles of vulnerability. Who is the closest in geographic proximity? Who is the best friend or relative of the victim? Who has their own significant history with trauma and loss? And I couldn't help but think, what an incredibly, you know, competent principal who knows a lot about crisis intervention. Now let me move to the third type of the school shooter. This is the one believed to be traumatized, depressed, even suicidal. They've often suffered some really severe abuse. Um, they've had a lot of stress and losses in their lives. Some of the shooters have had parents that they were separated from because the fathers were either deceased or in jail. They may have moved frequently, substance abuse problems, and as I said earlier, they may be extremely suicidal. Well, I also went to Red Lake, Minnesota, where the young man killed nine, and then he killed himself. And let's just take a moment and look at the trauma history of Jeffrey Weiss. Parents separated when he was young lived with mom and her boyfriend, and the discipline was severe, being locked in the closet 
even being locked out of the house during Minnesota winters as a punishment. His dad died by suicide when Jeff was eight, and that was actually after a standoff between his father and the tribal police. When he was nine, his mom was severely injured in a car accident and suffered brain damage and basically has been in an institution ever since, moved around frequently. And I was told when I was there that Jeffrey never really wanted to return to the Red Lake Chippewa Reservation in extreme North Minnesota. He was bullied and harassed at school, described as a black garbed loner, floating alone, an introvert at school, but extremely extroverted on the internet, and he was fascinated with Hitler and neo-Nazism. Now you're wondering, why would a Red Lake Chippewa, a Native American, be a fan of Hitler? It had to do with purity of race and being angry that members of his tribe were marrying outside of the tribe. And of course, he posted the entire scenario online of what he actually carried out some months later. And I said something earlier about there are often some pretty dramatic warning signs that unfortunately a number of times we have missed in our homes and our schools and communities. And of course, Jeffrey Weiss also talked a lot about what he was going to do. In fact, he was actually arrested by the police one year before he actually committed the shooting. And there you see some specifics about school and how he had stopped attending at various times. He was actually expelled for unspecified reasons. He was depressed. He'd had his Prozac increased. He was under psychiatric care. And he was fascinated with the film called Elephant. And Elephant actually received a film festival award. It's about one day in a secondary school in America that culminates in a very gory Columbine-like shooting at the end. And when I watched Elephant, one of the things I was really struck by is it never showed an adult interacting with an adolescent in a meaningful way. It was almost as if the adults did not exist in their lives. And it was frustrating to see it portrayed that way. But back to Jeffrey Weiss, his friends commented that he loved Elephant. He especially liked to watch the ending, the real violent part, over and over. And here's one of the quotes he left behind on the Internet. Most people have never dealt with people who have faced the kind of pain that makes you so physically sick at times, makes you so depressed you can't function, makes you so sad and overwhelmed with grief that eating a bullet or sticking your head in a noose seems welcoming. And obviously, we would hope that any time something like that is posted, that classmates and peers reading it would get an adult involved. You know, and thankfully, there have been what we term near misses around the country, and there's been quite a few of them, where something's posted on the internet, people are worried, they tell school and law enforcement authorities, they get help for their classmate or their friend, they basically step forward. Sometimes it's as simple as there's a hit list, and a couple of kids aren't really that concerned about it, until maybe their favorite teacher's name goes on the list. Now they're horrified, and they decide to do something. And a really good question is, is pretty simple. Why is it that kids don't come forward and tell us about violent, homicidal, or suicidal threats? So here's what the literature says, and I've been working on this for like 30 years, and here's what kids have also said to me personally. I didn't want to get involved. I didn't think it could happen. I feared retaliation. I'm sorry, but I have been conditioned not to tell. Perhaps the reason that will bother everybody listening the most is when they say, I'm sorry, but I don't trust the adults at school. They haven't built a relationship with me. 
they don't really know much about me and my hopes and dreams, and I'm going to be very unlikely to go to them and tell them anything. Oh, and that anonymous reporting thing, I'm not sure that I trust that somehow it's not going to get back to somebody that I was the one that made the call and told the authorities. So Red Lake would be an example of why we are so frustrated. The report that came out some years later, and by the way, that was a small school, a school of 310 students. So anybody working in a large secondary school, everything that I just discussed, you can magnify it many times in terms of the challenge of making sure every kid feels connected to school and every kid feels like somebody cares whether or not they show up today at school or not. So Red Lake was a small place, and 39 students knew at least something about his violent plans. Five of them communicated with him about the plan violence daily. And eight teens were the ones that watched the elephant film with him over and over. Though so this was the study about prior knowledge of schools, uh, shootings, and violence. Some pretty concerning statistics there from our Secret Service and a study that came out only just a couple of years ago. Basically, 81% of the time, at least one person had prior knowledge of the attack. 59% of the time, more than one person had knowledge. Look at their finding that only 4% actually tried to even talk the attacker out of the violence. Many of them said they just didn't believe it could happen. One of them commented, well, he was talking so matter-of-factly about shooting up the school while he was eating pizza, how was I to take him seriously? So, interesting for us to think about in terms of how do we change that climate. And then you have the classroom adventure theory that was proposed by McGee and DeBar Bernardo. And they talked about most school shootings, small towns, suburbs in the south, and in the west part of our country, that shooters often came from a family where there was a good deal of dysfunction. They knew their way around guns. Most guns, I think more than 95% of the time, the guns actually came from the students' homes. Thus my comments early on about parents accepting responsibility when they own a gun to keep it from a disturbed, angry, impulsive, substance abusing young person who might just reside in your own home. Then it talks about many of them being introverted, uh, lacking empathy, lacking connections to their schools, this all or nothing thinking. They were often feeling like they had been grievously wrong. They were really angry at the school and pretty much everyone in it. So they wanted notoriety. And actually, unfortunately, the media always gives them notoriety. There's often this, in the initial days, uh, how do we find out about the sh shooter? Who were they? What do we know about them? Uh, the investigation into their lives, their pictures, uh, all splashed across our national media, uh, papers, and news. And most of these attacks were planned, not over a couple of days, but over weeks and months. And then it's interesting that they pointed out the manager triad element all present, wish to die, wish to kill, wish to be killed. Most school shooters, have those that survived, said that they didn't expect to survive. They thought that if they didn't shoot themselves after the shooting, that it would essentially be suicide by cop. And others later attempted or even died by suicide while they were in jail. And I think these researchers pretty, pretty well, prolific journal writing, computer postings, or videotapes spelled out their violent plans. 
and they often threatened or boasted to others about what they were planning. So, it's very important that we realize these warning signs and we increase mental health services. And, you know, I did work in the schools for 26 years, and it really saddens me to say to you that we really don't provide much in the way of mental health services at schools. Uh, school psychologists, and I was the national president a few years ago, primarily they're working in special education. They're uh, working on assessment when a child is suspected of having a disability. School counselors today are pretty overwhelmed with clerical and scheduling duties. California, in particular, the last I knew, had one of the worst ratios of counselors to students in the nation. And we really need to provide mental health services in schools and really set it up so that counselors can counsel and school psychologists can really work on emotional and behavioral issues and not always be consumed totally by special education. But there are some key points about violence. And, you know, sometimes I've asked really, like, what's changed? And really the perception everyone has because of these shootings and the dramatic coverage is that schools are dangerous places. And it's really important that I emphasize that schools might actually be the safest place a kid in America could possibly be at any given time. We have about 52 million children who go to school in this country. And our statistics say that your chance of being a homicide victim at school are about one in 2.5 million. And I believe strongly that one violent death on school grounds in America is unacceptable. But I'm gonna argue we gotta work on violence prevention, not just at school, in our homes and neighborhoods. Because you see, I know that most kids in America actually get murdered in their own homes. But what has changed about school violence over the decades? Well, the bottom line is you have multiple homicides. Years ago, was one kid mad at another kid, and they had a reason, and unfortunately, they maybe killed them, but they were mad at one kid. Or today, these shooters seem to be angry at everybody, and you have multiple deaths. And then a number of the signs uh, I've already talked about, and certainly doesn't it make sense that if a kid is glorifying previous school shooters, turning in papers on them, clipping newspaper headlines out, and putting them up uh, on the wall of their room, we should be very concerned uh, about what's going on. And mass murderers are almost always suicidal. And you know, when the initial Secret Service study came out more than a decade ago, um, and it found that two-thirds of school shooters were suicidal. You know what I naively thought? Wow, schools are going to wake up and realize every school should have a suicide prevention program. But unfortunately, that is not the case. And also, when that report was released in 2000 and 2001 and 2002, it said two-thirds of school shooters were actually the victim of bullying. Well, again, I naively thought, wow, we're going to put bullying prevention in every school. Well, we have it now, but it's 2013. Almost all of the bullying prevention legislation for schools in this country came about after 2008. So we were very slow to respond to that Secret Service study. And I'd like to go through some suggestions, some things that I believe strongly uh, are important if we're going to prevent further shootings and tragic outcomes for young people. And that is adolescent privacy needs to be limited. And what do I mean by that? I'm not a fan of laptops. I like the desktop. I like it on the kitchen counter or in the family room. I believe that parents do need to take charge of technology. It is a privilege. It is not a right. 
they need to know passwords, they need to be checking, and I'll even use the word, they need to be snooping, especially if you already know that your kid has problems. It's like, pay attention. In today's world, it's not enough to know your kid's friends. You've got to know the kid's friend's parents. You have to be the one that is checking. And very commonly, parents want to, at all cost, protect their kid from receiving consequences. And when I talk to parents, I always say things like this. I really value and respect the people at work in schools. They are dedicated to helping children. They do not have it in for your child. Please hear their side of the story before you go attacking them or you go uh, to the length of speaking negatively to your child about their school and the teacher. So basically the message is support the school. And when the school tells you there's a problem, follow through. Support the consequences that are provided. And it's almost like this has to begin at an early age where kids apologize. They make restitution. Basically, all kids misbehave. And the question is always provide logical consequences, but always separate their worth as a person from uh, the deed, uh, the deed being separated from the doer. So just very important to support schools and let your children experience consequences. That is how they learn, as well as follow through with the due process. If your kids already had some problems with the juvenile authorities, don't hide everything else from the authorities because they are in a position to help the families and provide a pretty dramatic intervention. We've already Hi. talked to – yes. I'm sorry to intervene, but we do have one question that's fairly pertinent. That, okay, um, go ahead. In California, we've seen a trend in the schools to decrease the number of counselors, and we see very few elementary school counselors. In light of what you're saying here, this seems like that trend is very short-sighted. How important are the elementary counselors? I believe they're Elementary counselors are absolutely essential. I actually train counselors here in their master's program. Think about the importance of things like guidance lessons at the elementary level, teaching kids at an early age about getting adults involved, teaching them about warning signs of you know, sexual molestation and inappropriate behavior, building relations with them, setting up you know, a kinder, gentler school climate, anti-bullying prevention programs, absolutely. I am always going to be arguing for more, not less, school counselors. And, you know, we've got to reach school boards. We've got to reach taxpayers. And unfortunately, nobody is really calling for more mental health services in the aftermath of these tragedies. And, you know, I'm now on a foundation with parents from Newtown who want to make a difference in the aftermath of sadly losing their children. But you know, the bottom line is nothing changed after Newtown, and yet it was extremely horrific in that the victims were young, elementary students, and so many were killed on a single day. So absolutely, whatever we can do to reach our taxpayers and our school boards and to demonstrate the essential role that school counselors play. And, you know, the bottom line is a kid that is not in a good place in terms of a positive mental health outlook, they are not going to benefit at an optimal level from their educational instruction. And if we want those high test scores, we need to realize at the foundation of that are connections to school, relationship, and positive mental health and really being able to solve problems and get the help that we need. So here's the question. Does everyone listening believe anyone could actually stop a school shooting? And I'm going to argue yes. And news coverage of a shooting in California last year well described a mom who was home, whose house was 
right across the street from the school, like saw a kid walk by, clearly carrying a gun, and she kind of went like, oh, well, she didn't make the call. And the, killed, uh, the kid shot a couple of people at school. So we've got to have everybody involved. I like to say school safety is an inside job. The commitment, first of all, must come from the students, then from the faculty, parents, and the entire community. And we got to recognize uh, the rehearsal and planning. I do support school resource officers. And I'm very sorry to report where I live in Florida, they actually have been reduced. And I'm for more of them as well. But I also believe that what's called the hardware measures of school security, which would be more police, more surveillance cameras, more metal detectors alone are not the answer. And going back to counselors, I like the phrase more mental detectors. And I've already talked about the need for implementing bullying prevention and suicide prevention programs. And I had an op-ed piece in the Huffington Post this week basically saying, the great thing, it's bullying prevention month. All schools have some form of a bullying prevention program, but there's a strong association between bullying and suicide and they need suicide prevention programs as well. And we really want the culture at school that focuses on wellness, mental health, being connected to school, feeling like everyone cares about every single student. And then there's another very good program, which is anonymous tip lines. And some of those are extremely sophisticated and very well done. One of them that I'm the most familiar with is a program called School Reach. And I very much support the concept of how do we make sure we have a phone line, we have some kind of web program where a kid could warn us immediately of impending violence and what might be going down tomorrow, and how do we make sure that some adult at school is actually going to receive that information and be able to take significant action. You know, the bottom line is that kids always know what is going on in schools, and we have to be smart enough to ask them. Surveys, although here's an example. Went to a superintendent one time with a survey about school safety questions for kids and teachers that we had arranged for the school to, to do at absolutely no cost. The superintendent looked through the questions that had to do with connection, school climate, safety, bullying, and I remember him looking up and saying something like this, well, if we were to ask these questions, we were to survey and find out we had a problem in one of these areas, then we'd be held accountable to do something about it. And permission was denied. And I'd like to think that other principals and superintendents would realize the importance of, let's find out what the problems are, and let's get the students involved in their own safety through getting their input on surveys or something as simple as give every kid in the classroom a floor plan of the school and tell them shade in any area where you don't feel safe. Well, let's do it even better than that. Let's make it more sophisticated. Shade in any area before the first bell where you don't feel safe. Oh, this next one, it's labeled during the school day. This next one is after school or at extracurricular activities. And all of a sudden, we're going to know exactly where we need to increase our supervision and what we need to do differently. I'm also a strong advocate of pledges, safety pledges for students. And they're really pretty straightforward. I will let an adult determine the seriousness of a violent threat. I will report the presence of a weapon on campus to the nearest adult immediately. And of course, it's more than just read this, sign this. It's about talking with students about the important role that they play in their own safety. Limiting media violence. 
interesting character out there by the name of Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. He's a psychologist, okay, but what really makes him interesting, he's a retired Army Ranger Colonel. He wrote a book called The Art of Killing, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, but his second book is entitled Why Are We Teaching Our Children to Kill? Looking at the desensitization of violence through our video games. And a simple point would be parents should pay attention and should stop shelling out the $75 to buy the latest violent video game. And you know, you could buy one where you are the school shooter. The violence in video games just keeps escalating. Now, there has been a lot of discussion post Newtown, but as I said earlier, not a lot of action. So these next couple of things that I'm going to say, they do represent my viewpoints, and I know that some people do disagree, but I'm sorry, I do not agree with arming teachers. And I was actually on a program uh, in Michigan where I followed a school superintendent in Texas who has what's called the Guardian Program, and he does believe in arming his teachers. Now, here's what I thought was really interesting, because my keynote followed his, and I couldn't help but notice, and by the way, my topic was mental health and school crisis prevention and intervention. And I couldn't help but notice that the superintendent who believes in arming his teachers walked out of the large auditorium just as I was being introduced. And perhaps in fairness, maybe he had to catch a plane, but I interpreted that as he was not interested in the mental health aspects of prevention. In fact, that was pretty evident in the questions that he was asked after his session in the Q&A. So I like to see teachers armed with more school counselors, more social workers, more school psychologists, smaller classes so they can get to know every single student well. I even argue that a lot of students' motivation is, particularly at the elementary level, they want to please the teacher so they'll work hard, but only if they believe the teacher truly cares about their hopes and dreams. Now, I also want to comment on another program that I'm quite familiar with. I heard the founder of the ALICE program speak at yet another state school safety conference. ALICE, every letter stands for something. I've already talked about supporting alert. I want everybody to be alert. Nobody would argue with the eye for good information. You see something, call immediately, provide precise information about the what the person looked like, why you suspect they might be there to harm someone, what direction they were going. Did you see a weapon? All right. And then I think everybody would agree with Schools need to have good lockdown procedures, planning, good communication, barricade doors, different things to protect students, all right? And I'm going to go to the E part, evacuation. I think everyone would agree with having good evacuation procedures and being able to go to another location for reasons that might have to do with natural disasters or just a lot of other circumstances. And of course, Evacuation to another location is the hardest when the school building is isolated. There are not nearby schools, churches, or businesses that you could possibly go to. But let me go back to the C. It stands for counterattack, teaching children to charge a gunman. And I, when I heard Officer Crane, the founder of this program, talk, he only shared with us the most terrific scenarios that our schools have ever experienced. He didn't even imply that there are situations where, yes, there's a gun at school, there's a chance for violence, but the perpetrator or potential shooter is basically calmed down. 
And we had an excellent example of that in an elementary school in Georgia this fall where an extraordinary uh, lady calmed the person down. Nobody was hurt. She even talked to 911 and said, we're coming out now. Don't shoot. He's turning himself in. So please know that there have been many situations where things are calmed down and no one is hurt or injured in any way. And I just question the wisdom of statements like teaching four fourth graders, they can take down anybody, one of you on each of the extremities. And I actually heard Officer Crane answer this question. Well, if you charge the gunman, aren't they likely to shoot a few people? His answer was yes, but for the greater good of saving the majority of the students. And I do recognize that there are probably situations and will be others where adults need to take some pretty dramatic actions. But I do not believe we need to be teaching children, especially elementary students, to do this. I'm concerned about developmental levels. I'm concerned about not taking into consideration students with special needs. I'm concerned about liability issues when schools are actually teaching students to charge a gunman. But perhaps most of all, I'm concerned that this gives children the impression that schools are very dangerous places. And as I said earlier, schools are very safe places. No, they are not perfect. And I'm very sorry that that is not the case. But we need to be careful to make sure that everyone, and especially children, don't feel like the next school shooting is right around the corner in their school. And I'm also not a fan of some of the dramatic crisis drills that are being carried out. Some personnel have commented like, well, we all knew it was a drill, but it was so realistic. People still panicked. They ran. Some got knocked down. They got hurt. We lost like an entire day's instructional time. My advice would be want to carry out a dramatic, uh, realistic uh, crisis drill. Do it on a day when the kids aren't in school. Do it on an in-service day. I don't think we need to expose children to SWAT teams and gunfire. And these next points I've made in many ways, but I, I do want to say and it, it's a pretty simple uh, thought there, and that is the school should be a place that students like, a place where they feel connected and enjoy their experience. Essentially, we need a school where a kid would never think of blowing it up because they like the school and the people in it. And very quickly to answer this question, I get asked this a lot. Oh, this kid's very interested in violent music. Should I be worried? Tell me about him. If I hear that he's really sweet to his little sister, he does a good job taking care of the family pet, he's in an organized anything, he goes somewhere with mom and dad once in a while, I'm not going to be too concerned. But if you tell me he's really mean as hell to his little sister, he's not in an organized anything, he's withdrawn from all adults, he shows no remorse or empathy for his behavior, he's fascinated with guns, violence, and bombs, and he tried to hurt the cat yesterday, I'm going to be very concerned. I just gave you every FBI warning sign of use violence except one. They would add fire setting. And the FBI said these are additive. So when we know these behaviors exist, we need to all be putting in place mental health interventions in our schools and our communities. There are a couple of slides here about the Secret Service study, their findings. Sadly, I believe that study that was released several times was largely ignored by the schools around the country. In fact, I've heard very little about it in years, but realizing that there's no specific profile, there's a lot of variation between the school shooters, realizing there was a lot of leakage. What do I mean by that? 
they almost all talked about what they were going to do, and we talked about prior knowledge a few moments ago. And then they well documented that two-thirds were suicidal, two-thirds were the victims of bullying. Those have obvious implications for prevention in our schools and communities. And my closing thoughts are really on this slide. And if you don't remember uh, Craig Scott, sorry, he lost his sister, Rachel, at Columbine High School. He hid underneath the library table. A student next to him was shot and killed. But on his graduation day, he had what I believed is a very profound statement. He basically said, we must reach the unreachable. And I believe we have a number of kids in every school in America that we are not currently reaching. Having more counselors and school psychologists would certainly help. Having more activities and ways to get them connected to the school would help a lot. So how do we get these disillusioned youth involved in activities, help prepare them for finding a job and a purpose and establishing social ties? And those are the main points that I wanted to make. Uh, I'll entertain any questions. A lot of my writings are posted at the Suicide and Violence Prevention website at Nova Southeastern University. I have about 16 different articles published in District Administration Magazine. And Kathy, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Scott. That was an excellent presentation. We have an awful lot of questions, but I've kind of grouped them into about six of them because many people are asking the same ones. First of all, is there some kind of questionnaire that can be administered to students that can help identify students of need or those students who are prone to violence? Well, you know, the bottom line is that prediction in this area is really difficult. Um, however, there is one instrument called the PETRA, P-E-T-R-A. It is basically uh, available from PAR, P-A-R Incorporated, Psychological Assessment Resources. It was actually developed by a school psychologist right here in Florida, and it very much focuses on questions that could be a part of an evaluation. I mentioned district administration a moment ago. I have two different articles there about threat assessment. And a lot of it is really about threat reduction. How do we reduce stressors on a kid who's suspected of threatening violence? And how do we investigate it thoroughly with a team approach, which is what all of our major entities have recommended. Threat assessment needs a teacher who knows the kid in question well. It needs a mental health person at school, a counselor, a psychologist. It needs an administrator, and it needs a law enforcement representative. So I would suggest a good review of threat assessment, which is something we could even consider doing a webinar solely on that topic. And I also do recommend investigating the PETRA from PAR. Excellent. Thank you. Another question is, once administration has been notified of a plausible threat and lockdown procedures are implemented and the police activated, what type of notification should go out to the building occupants? You know, who should receive the notification, the staff, the students, the parents? What are your thoughts? Well, working in this field a long time, I really believe in just telling the truth. Um, we don't have to give a lot of explicit details. We always need to keep in mind developmental levels of children. But when we're in a lockdown procedure, I think the simplest thing is to communicate to all students, all staff. We're in a lockdown uh, situation. Students listen to the nearest adult, do whatever they say. And this is the information we have at this point, and we'll keep you apprised as more information develops. And I also know that with parents, 
and the community, often an administrator's first response is to minimize or cover something up. And this almost always does not work. So letters out to parents, information on school websites, using the media to relay important information to parents, especially about where you can go to get help for your child. So the simplest thing in my mind is tell the truth. And I also believe the best decisions in a crisis situation are made by a group of people. And I would like to think that administrators would grab the nearest counselor or school psychologist and say, hey, this is what's happening. I'm thinking about this. Give me your input. Excellent, excellent. I have a question, and they're asking, is it a good idea for school districts to list a facility map of all the school sites on their main website? All right. So, you know, there was quite a scare a number of years ago when Al-Qaeda had some floor plans of schools in America. Um, this is sort of a tough one, although one of the things that has been said is, like, the more we publicize our crisis planning, our alertness, uh, we have security, SROs, the less likely that some disturbed adult out there is going to think that our particular school would be a good target. And in general, I think that publishing and making those things available is fine, but at the same time, I'd want to have a lot of information about what good crisis plans and security and how everybody in our school was alert. We meet and greet everybody who comes into the building. We lock all but the front door, or maybe we even have to buzz somebody in that door. We teach all of our students never to open a door for someone. We teach everybody to be alert to somebody in our building who's not signed in. And no, it's not enough to say, sir, you need to go to the office. It's like, let me show you the way to the office. OK. And one last question. Um, parents, because of the media, are wanting or demanding armed guards or law enforcement on the campus or even panic buttons as a response intervention. Are these measures recommended? Are they prudent to consider? What are your thoughts? Well, I think this should really be left to a local decision. I do believe that virtually every school in the country has had some form of a crisis. Thankfully, most of those did not involve the shooting. But I always believe that we should go back and look at what incidents have we had, what worked, what didn't work so well, how can we prevent something like that from ever happening again. And I do know that when a shooting actually occurs in a specific location, it's like staff and students need to see something that is different. And that often does involve more security guards. I do not believe that every school in this country needs an armed police officer. I believe that it, it is necessary. And a few schools in our country, those would be the ones that have had a history of lots of difficulties, really, with violence in countless areas. And I only wish that parents would be lobbying so fervently for more mental health services in their local schools. I agree. Well, everybody, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to remind everyone that we have got many courses on teen and safe schools, on violence in the schools, active shooter on campus, suicide prevention, as well as the School Safety Center on our PNC Bridge through Keenan. Dr. Poland, this has been a wealth of information, and I cannot tell you enough how much we appreciate your offer to join us this morning. And if anybody has any questions for Dr. Poland, you can go ahead and e email to me at kespinoza at keenan.com, and I will contact Dr. Poland for you. Thank you again for everyone who is joining us. And this concludes our webinar today. Thank you again.